it's my great pleasure to welcome Professor Allenbell here. Um, those of you who have been in the EC, as you know, we use his books, his translation of the Upanishads and other things. Um, so it, it really is an honor to have him with us. I'd like to particularly um, thank the Rohrbach family for funding this lecture. Um, thank you from all of us. Um, Patrick Olivelle was the chair of the Department of Asian Studies from 94 to 2007, and he's currently the Mossaker Chair Emeritus of the Humanities at the University of Texas in Austin. He was the recipient of the Guggenheim Fellowship and was elected president of the American Oriental Society in 2005. His books have won awards from the American Academy of Religion and the Association of Asian Studies. In 2011, he was awarded the Career Research Excellence Award of the University of Texas at Austin. He has published over 25 books and over 50 scholarly articles. His recent works include King, Government, Governance and Law in Ancient India, Reimagining Ashoka, Vishnu's Code of Law, The Life of the Buddha, and Manu's Code of Law. So, Welcome, Professor Olivelle. What is a classic? How do you define a classic? A lot of ink has been spilled over the past century or so, and more recently a lot of megabytes have been wasted in search of an answer. I'm not an expert on this issue, and I have looked at, but I have looked at some what has been written from Charles Augustine Sandbourg in the middle of the 19th century, Italo Calvino in the middle of the 20th century, and to the 1913 book by Aniki Mukherjee, What is a Classic, published by Stanford, who looks at the issue from a post-colonial perspective. I do not intend to waste your time and mine in relitigating this question, even though I hope some light may be shed on it, but what I have to say today. What struck me most about the proffered uh, definitions is the large dose of subjectivity contained in them, as if a classic is any book that can move you. For this reason, I really like what a couple of Cleveland eighth graders said, and I quote, classics are books your fathers give you and you keep to give to your children. <laughs> and classics are, and this is especially good for us, Classics are those great pieces of literature considered worthy to be studied in English classes of high school and college. Note that these kids introduce history into the definition and move away from subjectivity. Classics are defined for you by your parents or teachers or college, cu college curricula, and you define them for your children. The historical element is also central although from an economic point of view, in the tongue-in-cheek definition offered by Mark Van Doren, he says, a classic is any book that stays in print. It is this historical dimension of classics, especially of Indian classics, that I want to focus on today. There are three unequal parts to my talk today. Number one, the creation of the classic. Number two, historical contexts and three, translation. I found in my big classes at UT, you would always have to put a, you know, what I'm going to speak about there. You don't have to do that here. Your students are much better. <laughs> Let us look at the definition of classics as books that stay in print. For the moment, ignoring the print-on-demand technology that will keep all books in print indefinitely. To stay in print, a book has to appeal to a sufficiently large number of people who are willing to part with their hard-earned money to buy the book. Now go back in time to India during the period, say, between the first century before the Common Era and about 1500 of the Common Era, a millennium and a half, more or less. There were no printing presses then. A book was a manuscript. It had to be copied by hand, one copy at a time. In India, unlike Europe, 
writing material was cheap and plentiful. Either birch bark in the extreme northwest of the subcontinent or palm leaves elsewhere. Here's a palm leaf manuscript. The availability of cheap writing material produced an explosion of manuscripts, so much so that Sheldon Pollock estimates there are about 50 million manuscripts extant in India today. Compare this to the totality of Greek manuscripts from every period, that number around 30,000. Given the wet and humid tropical climate of India, as well as the zillions of silverfish and other bugs roaming around in search of a good book to eat, the average lifespan of a manuscript was about a century or two. If a book lacked sufficient appeal for it to be copied several times during that period, it would die a natural death. A modern out-of-print book will still be available in a library, while a book whose last manuscript provided breakfast for a friendly bug will simply disappear from human history. I give you some of those manuscripts that bugs have been, there we go. These are some of the things that I've been working on. I think these are my own photographs. Oops. Uh, oops, who, how, did he, how did he get in there? All right. And this actually is a birch bark manuscript. These are much larger, as you can see. Uh, and it's written in ink. And uh, it's, uh, this too is all broken up. It is this repeated rewriting over centuries and millennia that has preserved Indian text until modern times. So whether classic or not, for a book to survive in India, it had to be appealed to a sufficient number of people who would spend time, money, and energy to copy it or to have it copied. It is extraordinary, but true, that books of ancient India available today have been selected for us by perhaps a hundred generations of readers and writers. At least some of them found these books to be sufficiently important or appealing to be copied and repeatedly and continuously for over a, a millennium. Yet not all books that generations of Indians took the trouble to copy can be considered classics. Among the 30 million or so of extant manuscripts in India, there are ritual handbooks, pamphlets on medicine and astrology, and sectarian text and recipe books. Some definitions of classics we saw attempt to narrow the range by appealing to subjective interest or emotion. Although such subjective interest, whether religious appeal or aesthetic pleasure, it is a significant component we still would not call any book that grabs someone's attention or interest a classic. A classic has stood the test of time. We have inherited the classics and they have been pre-selected for us. So the Cleveland eighth grader was right. A classic is passed down from generation to generation as books worthy of being read and absorbed. I want to take a minute to dwell on this historical aspect of Indian classics. This history has both a modern Western and an ancient Indian component. On the modern side, a watershed event was the launch of the book series, Sacred Books of the East. The brainchild of the German emigre and Oxford professor, Friedrich Max Muller. Conceived as a series of 24 volumes to be completed in eight years, it ended up with 50 volumes produced over a period of 16 years from 1879 to 1894, a colossal achievement in publishing and translation. Even though the texts selected were partly due to accidental circumstances, such as the availability of suitable translators, some actually died in the process, Max Muller's vision and predilections are visible in the books he selected. 34 are from India eight from ancient Iran, only six from China, and two representing Islam. Published by the prestigious Oxford University Press, the English-speaking world was presented for the first time with an authoritative collection of Eastern religious classics. The very first volume translated by Max Muller himself consisted of the Upanishads, viewed by this time as containing the highest expressions of the Indian mystical spirit. We have other 
and more recent examples to define and introduce Eastern classics, such as the 1990 volume, Eastern Canons, Approaches to the Asian Classics, edited by Theodore de Berry and Irene Bloom. Max Muller's selection of Indian texts, however, was not completely arbitrary. India had already pre-selected many of these for the modern re reader and scholar. Apart from the writing and rewriting of texts I have noted, Indian scholars and theologians also selected certain texts from their past for special attention. They created canons of sacred and secular classics through memorization, commentaries, specialized studies, and public and ritual recitations. Let us take the most classic of all the Indian religious classics, the oldest book of India, the Rig Veda. Just translated by my colleagues, Joel Brereton and, uh, and Stephanie Jamieson. This is the book in three volumes. An analysis of the three moments of its literary history, composition, compilation, and transmission, provides a wonderful example of both the historical context of the birth of a classics and the history that gave birth to a classic. There were three phases in the creation of this particular text. First, there were individual priest poets of extraordinary skill who composed hymns for use at high rituals of rich and royal patrons between about 1500 and 1200 before the common era. It's quite old. A millennium or more before writing was sub introduced into India. So there was no writing. This is actually an unwritten text. Several points emerged from this. First, the existence of highly refined poetic techniques, including complex meters in the ancient period. We will see an example later on. Second, the existence of rich patrons who were connoisseurs of poetry, able to recognize poetic talent. Third, as in later times, there were economic and socio-political underpinnings to the production of this literature. In the second phase, the family lineages to which the priest poets belonged made collections of the hymns they created. Several points emerged from this phase. First, the hymns were memorized by the creators themselves and by their descendants, pointing both to a highly developed mnemonic skills that will continue for another millennium or two, and to an organized system of education, training, and oral transmission. Second, hymns created for one liturgical location and for one patron were reused at other occasions, thus creating the beginnings of a routinized ritual and a move away from poetic creativity and spontaneity. Third, some of the later priests in these families may not have been as good poets as their ancestors and were only too glad to use their poetic heritage in their priestly functions. Fourth, Given that these family collections were anthologies, there must have been a process of selection, both inclusion and exclusion from among the available hymns. Here then we come to the creation of classics. Some hymns were judged worthy of inclusion, while others were excluded. The third and final phase consisted of creating a larger anthology of the family anthologies. They are called the family books and constitutes books two through seven, they're altogether 10, of the extant Rig Veda. But the editors of these larger collections were not satisfied with simply collecting the family books. They appended books one and books eight through 10 create, to create the Rig Veda as we have it. It would take me too long to go into the reasons behind these new books, but they contain some of the later and more philosophical hymns, such as the famous Purusha hymn, hymn of the man, and the skeptical hymn about the beginning of the universe that I will analyze below and we will read today with some of the faculty. The latest research also reveals that this work of collecting the family books and creating the larger liturgical hymn book of the Rig Veda was an imperial undertaking by the emergent Kuru state. And we will encounter the Kurus again later when I turn to the Bhagavad Gita. Scholars have seen a connection between epic and empire and here, around the year 1000 before Christ, we have an emergent state in northern India turning to the creation of a classic ritual system 
along with a book containing the hymns to be used in it as a literary and religious foundation of the state. The afterlife of this and other classics is as, is as significant as their creation. A classic becomes part of the religious, philosophical, and aesthetic life of a people and a society. The value placed on the Rig Veda by the later priestly communities cannot be overstated. This can be seen in the manner in which they protected this treasure from change and contamination, which was easy with an orally transmitted text. So they created a parallel, they created parallel Rig Vedas, this is, this is mind blowing, that were totally artificial, but were secondary texts against which the recited text could be checked for accuracy. Let us look in these overheads. Okay. The lens to which they went to protect the Rig Veda. Keep in mind that all these artificial texts also had to be memorized. There are many such called parters, Pada Pata, Krama Pata, Jata Pata, and Gana Pata. Okay. So, what we have here, Sanghita is the one that is actually recited. You'll go A, B, C, D, E. Right? In the Pada Pata, A, B, C, D, E will be separated. The, all the aphonic combinations that you have in Sanskrit will be dissolved. Krama is the interesting thing. You go A, B, B, C, C, D, D, E. You go up and down, right? So basically, it has no meaning, right? Only words, scrambled, right? So there, there's less likelihood of change because you change what you understand. Jatha Pata, you can see. Then you go to the Gana Pata, you know, which is just mind-boggling, right? How you repeat everything. Huh? So uh, uh, Rig Veda, when you come to the Gana Pata, would be about 10 times as long right? because it has been repeated, repeated. So if you get to the very first verse of the Rig Veda, I will come to that in a minute. Agnim ile puro hitam yanyasya devam ritvijam. The Krama part would, be, would say, Agnim ile ile puro hitam puro hitam yanyasya yanyasya devam devam ritvijam. And it goes on like that. I don't have time to read the whole thing. <laughs> this effort at building a fortress around a text to keep it immutable is perhaps unprecedented in human history. The Rig Veda and other Vedic texts were orally transmitted and preserved in memory for over 2,000 years. Human memory as a vehicle of transmission is even more selective of the texts it chooses to transmit than the perishable material of manuscripts. Both forms carry forward from generation to generation, only those texts that are viewed as worthy of memory and manuscript. So, we could and do have what I would term forgotten classics, that is texts that were viewed by so many, by many as classics at a particular place and period of time, but then fell into disfavor or disuse for a variety of reasons and thus disappeared from history or at least from the manuscript tradition. We sometimes know of them because others mention or, or cite from them. Megasthenes, for example, an explorer ambassador of Seleucus I to the court of Chandragupta, the father of the emperor Ashoka and the founder of the Indian Mauryan dynasty around 500 before Christ. Megasthenes wrote a classic called Indica in Greek, which was an account of in the Indian land, society, and state and of the large metropolis, Pataliputra, by far the largest city of ancient India, what is today the modern Patna. Ancient Greek writers, such as the geographer Strabo, got most of their information about India from it, but the book was lost, and we now only have fragments of, from citations. Almost the same fate fell on a much more important classic, Kautilya's Arthashastra, the first century of the common era, a classic on kingship, governance, law, and warfare, often compared to Machiavelli's Il Principe. This text was extremely popular and influential in India for about five or six centuries and continued to draw attention of a few devoted scholars even during the medieval times. But it had lost its appeal and modern scholars feared that all its manuscripts might have been lost or destroyed. Then in 1905, out of the blue, someone gave a complete manuscript of the work to the librarian of the University of Mysore. 
Miraculously, only a single manuscript, along with three copies of it, had survived. This is the book. This is the book I translated and published last year. I would not have been able to do that if not for this particular single manuscript that was saved. The point I want to make is that classics are indeed given by fathers to their children, and when this line is broken, book that was once a classic may now be not even in existence. Classics, or at least the allure of classics, they do change over time. Before leaving this topic of the selection and the selective transmission of classics, I want to touch briefly on what made these selections, what made these selections the sociology of classics. The very Latin term classicus has a sociological meaning, a citizen of the first and highest class. Sanskrit classics, whether it is the Veda, the Upanishads, and the Bhagavad Gita, or the most secular Sanskrit epic poetry, were composed, safeguarded, and commented on, and transmitted by a very small sliver of ancient Indian society, consisting of the Brahmin priestly class, and perhaps some people of the royal and aristocratic aristocratic classes. It was also an exclusively male domain. All women and all lower classes of society who together would have constituted perhaps over 90% or more of the population at any given time took no part in the process of creating the canon of Sanskrit classics. I want now to turn to the second part of my paper, namely the imperative to pay attention to the historical, that is the political, religious, social, and economic context in which these classics were created, appropriated, transmitted, and subject to continuous reinterpretation. I will, however, be brief here. In their repetition and transmission, texts take on a new life. They are pulled and pushed in different directions. They are put to new and varying uses, perhaps unimagined by their authors. In our own reading and understanding, moreover, we ourselves provide these texts with a new meaning. As a historian, I think this ongoing activity of appropriation is both inevitable and legitimate, and yet it has to be understood in its proper context. It is historically inappropriate to look to the 8th century monist theologian Shankara or to the 12th century realist and devotional theologian Ramanuja to understand the meaning of the Upanishads or the Bhagavad Gita in their original setting. But it is important to pay close attention to these new understandings in order to study the history of theology and textual interpretations taking place down the centuries. The major Sanskrit epic, the Mahabharata, was composed around the beginning of the common era. Recent studies have attempted to understand the epics as a fictional narrative created to present a particular view of kingship and society from the perspective of a conservative Brahmanical ideology. This was a time of great turmoil in northern India, from the, Ale from the Alexander the Great's invasions in the late fourth century before Christ, to the reforms of the third century BC instituted by Emperor Ashoka, who ruled most of India, reforms that pushed aside Brahmanical exceptionalism, to the repeated invasions of the first century before Christ to the first century after by Central Asian tribes that established strong polities within the Indian subcontinent. This was also the time when Buddhism was in ascendancy and garnered imperial patronage from Ashoka and from the new Central Asian arrivals, especially the Kushana kings of the first and second century uh, CE. We need to read the epic including the Bhagavad Gita, which is embedded in it, taking into full account this political, social, and religious turmoil engulfing North India and affecting in a special way the Brahmanical community. Its special position in society, its influence and way of life, and even its very livelihood were at stake. The Brahmanical elite responded, I am sure, in many ways, but one was peculiar to them. They responded, they responded through literature, just as their predecessors had done in composing the hymns of the Rig Veda. Yudhishthira, the hero of the epic, is presented as the ideal king, always devoted and subservient to Brahmins. It is also during this time that the famous Book of Manu was composed, a book that presented the legal framework of society and consolidated the central position of Brahmin 
within a properly ordered and hierarchically arranged society. That these efforts were effective in the long run is evident by the rise of the Gupta Empire firmly committed to Hinduism and Brahminical privilege in the, first century, in the fourth century after Christ and the final disappearance of Buddhism from much of India in the subsequent centuries. The book series that firmly established a canon of Eastern classics in the mind and imagination of the West was, as I have noted, Max Miller's Sacred Books of the East. That is one feature of this series that I have not yet addressed, a feature that leads to the final part of my presentation today. What Max Miller and his collaborators presented were English translations of Eastern religious classics composed in eight different languages, ranging from Arabic and Avestan to Sanskrit and Chinese. Most people today have access to ancient classics of both the East and the West only through translations, which is both inevitable and problematic. Even though most of us must perforce use translations, I think it is good for us to be reminded of the limitations imposed by this very medium. Is translation possible? is a question raised seemingly by seemingly serious people. I've been told that there is scientific evidence that bumblebees should not be able to fly. But fortunately, nobody told the bumblebee about it. I have done more than my fair share of translating, and I'm ready to debunk the extreme theory prevalent in some quarters that you really cannot translate. One is reminded of the famous Italian proverb traduttori sono traditori, which itself defies simple translation because its beauty lies in its alliteration and sound effect, but which, which means something like translators are traitors. <laughs> Clearly, there is a betrayal of the original in the very process of translating, and much, as the movie says, is lost in translation. But to say that one cannot translate is to say that one cannot really interact with someone other from another cultural and linguistic background, or even that one cannot learn a foreign language. I am living proof that this is false. I learned English only as a teenager. Yet translation leaves, leave, translations leave out as much as they include. We know that there are no exact synonyms in a single language. Porridge is not interchangeable with oatmeal. It would be awkward at best to say that Goldilocks found three bowls of oatmeal in the house of the three bears. Likewise, there are no exact equivalent terms in two different languages, especially when the languages are separated by cultural and temporal chasm as English and Sanskrit are. Translating involves making choices, and wise choices supplemented by footnotes and introductions sometimes can reveal as much or more than the obscure. So not all translation, not all translators, and not all translations are the same. Translating is a skill backed up by a deep knowledge of the language, history, and culture of the original text. Let me use a few examples from Sanskrit classics to illustrate why translation can only be approximations of the original. In Sanskrit, there is a breakdown of the normal textual categories we work with. For example, a composition in meter we would take to be poetry, while a prose work would generally be not qualified as poetry. In Sanskrit, we have non-poetic texts such as scientific books on law, medicine, and astronomy composed in meter. And many texts that the tradition calls kavya or epic poetry composed in prose. Poetry, of course, poses the most difficult challenge to translators, especially because much of the aesthetic pleasure of a poem is derived from the sounds of the language and the resonances of the words and phrases palpable in the original linguistic culture and mostly lost in translation. Let us look at the very first line of the very first verse of the earliest Indian text, the Rig Veda. The original runs, Agnim ile puro hitam, yanyasya devam ritvijam.
In 1889, Ralph Griffith translated this, I Lord Agni, the chosen priest, God, minister of sacrifice. A century later in 1981, Wendy Doniger, I pray to Agni, the household priest, who is the God of the sacrifice, the one who chants. I don't detect any poetry here. And just last year, Stephanie Jameson and Joel Bradgerton translated it. Agni do I invoke, the one place to the four, God and priest of the sacrifice. Much better. Pause for a moment to reflect on what it was wrong with the first two translations and what is right with the last. Let us for the moment ignore the correct meaning of the terms ile, purohitam, and ritvijam and focus on the very first word, agni. Fire, cognate of the Latin ignis, central to the Vedic sacrifice and the sacrificial religion. All three translators wisely refused to translate the term because Agni is not only fire, but the name of the corresponding God. But what is much more significant, to which I want to draw your attention, is the fact that Agni is the very first word of the very first verse of the very first hymn of the entire Rig Veda. The very first word of the very first book of India. As in many languages, but especially in Sanskrit, the first word of a sentence or verse carries the heaviest load of not only meaning, but of what the author wishes to emphasize. This is especially true in what are known as Sanskrit nominal sentences where without a verb or copula, two nouns are juxtaposed. For example, and this is taken from the Upanishad, Chakshusurya, I, son. What is the author trying to say? The son is the I, or the I is the son. Mind you, there is no word order in Sanskrit. The order of the words doesn't give a clue. Scholars have used the terms topic and comment to resolve the problem. In other words, what is the topic? What are we talking about? This is the known quantity. And in a nominal sentence, you put it second. The comment, that is the new element, introduced into the topic, is given prior place by placing it first. So in the example given, the topic we are discussing is sun we are asking, what is the sun? The answer is that the human eye is in reality the sun. So by placing Agni at the very beginning, even though this is not a nominal sentence, the author wants to emphasize that it is Agni and not any other divinity who is the god and priest of the sacrifice. As we saw, only Jameson and Bridgerton have paid sufficient attention to this feature of Sanskrit. Let us take another example uh, let, let us take another classic, Indian classic, cherished by both Indian and mo Indians, modern and ancient, and by Western scholars and readers. The Bhagavad Gita. Here is the first line of its first verse. Dharma kshetre kuru kshetre samaveta yujutsavara. Now here, we have the most central term of Indian civilization. Indian civilization. The term that dominates the discourse of the Gita, Dharma, occupying the first place of the text. I have seen no translation that accords this pride of place to Dharma. Almost all begin with, in the field of, with some translation or the, of Dharma filling the blank. The translation is complicated by the fact that dharma here is part of a nominal compound. It is also unclear what sort of a compound it is. Pardon my Sanskrit here. Is it a tatpurusha compound, meaning field of dharma, or a karmadharya compound, field that is dharma? In any case, keeping dharma as the first word in a translation of this verse poses a serious, perhaps insuperable challenge. But whatever Whatever the translation, we must pay attention. 
I'm going to lose my place here. But whatever the translation, we must pay special attention to dharma because the author has signaled to us that it, it is central to his work. A tentative translation, and mind you, I'm not going to translate the Bhagavad Gita. There are too many already. Um, is would be something like this. A uh, little awkward. Dharma field as Kuru's field, mustered there, yearning for the fight. My own ones and those of those Pandu's sons, what O Sanjaya had they done? One of the problems of translating poetry is the impossibility of rendering the original meter. We simply must forget it as a lost cause. But the aesthetics of poetry itself, I believe, needs to be reflected in a translation, however difficult that task may be. It is not necessary to mimic the poetic conventions of the original, but the reader must come away with some of the beauty of the original in the way the translation is constructed. One translator who excelled in this was the late A.K. Ramanujan, whose wonderful renderings of Kannada religious poems of the Lingayat community are unsurpassed. Look at this poem from a man named Basavanna. The rich will make temples for Shiva. What shall I, a poor man, do? My legs are pillar, my body the shrine, the head a cupola of gold. Listen, O Lord of the meeting rivers, things standing shall fall, but the moving shall ever stay. What can I say? The beauty and the richness of the English matches that of the original. The contrast between the gilded temples built by the rich and the powerful and the humble body of the devotee cannot be better drawn. The moving, fleeting, fragile body bent in devotion to the Lord shall remain forever, long after mighty temples have crumbled to dust. The problem with such translations, however, is how accurate are they? Is this a free rendering of the spirit of the original or does it accurately render the original? The conflict between accuracy and readability occurs constantly in the mind of a good translator. Indian poets compare the composition of a poem to the work of a carpenter crafting a chariot. It is painstaking, it requires skill, it demands attention to detail, and it must, it must follow a blueprint. The early Rig Vedic poets were that kind of skilled craftsmen, and often translators pay insufficient heed to the deliberate complexity lying behind the words. Let me take as an example the famous hig hymn, Rigveda 10, 1, 29, often called the Nasadiyam. This is viewed as a philosophical hymn presenting a, a skeptical view, view of our ability to know how creation came into being. So because of this skepticism, a very old thousand before Christ uh, uh, hymn, it has drawn the, the attention of scholars. Given the constraints of time, let us look at the final two verses, which is quite significant, okay? <clears throat> and here are two translations. On the left is the new one from Jameson and Brayton. On the right is, uh, is um, Wendy Doniger's. All translators have noted the question with which the hymn ends. There is, no resolution, uh, there is no resolution to the question, how did it all begin? Yet none but Brighton has paid attention to the incomplete meter and the incomplete grammar that supplements the incomplete answer at the end. The second foot of verse two, that is, yadiva dade yadivana, that's at the top. It should have 11 syllables, but it only has nine. It's a broken meter. Both the second foot and the final third foot end in two subordinate clauses that cry out for a companion main clause. If it was produced or if not, and in the last, or if he does not know. What happens if it was not produced or if he does not know? It remains unstated and incomplete as the hymn itself. There are only questions, there are only questions, but no answers. This completeness is mirrored in the incomplete meter and the incomplete grammar. 
There is also another feature of Sanskrit poetry that challenges the translator. Sanskrit poetry was meant to be sung, or at least chanted. In this respect, it was similar to songs. You can translate lyrics, but you cannot translate the melody. Beauty of sound when recited loud, and especially when chanted, is an integral part of Sanskrit poetry. Indian aesthetics Indian aesthetics is based on the concept of alankara, which means something like ornament or ornamentation. As a symbol, body can be decorated to look beautiful with bodily ornaments, so simple language can be made beautiful using poetic ornament. Sanskrit alankara, or poetic devices, is divided into two. Artha alankara, ornaments of meaning, and shabda alankara, ornaments of sound. The former consists of such common features as simile and metaphor, while the latter consists of the beauty of sound created by the poet, such as alliteration. To translate Sanskrit ornaments of meaning is challenging. To translate the ornaments of sound is impossible. So this entire area of, Sans of a Sanskrit poet's labor is left out in translations. As an example, and I promise you this will be the last, let me take up the very first verse of the famous epic poem, Raghuvamsha, the lineage of Raghu, of Kalidasa, the fourth century poet, the greatest India produced, a poet that ha who has been compared favorably to Shakespeare. This is the Sanskrit. Vagarthav iva sankrutta vagartha pratipattaye jagatah pitarav vande parvati Parameshwarao. United like speech and meaning to comprehend speech and meaning. Parents of the world I worship, Parvati and the Supreme Lord. Let me give you the three other opening verses just for your entertainment. I do not have the time to go into this. This is Kalidasa self-deprecating mood, right? Set in the simple Anushtubha shloka meter of four eight syllabic feet, this is a charming entry into the long epic poem. Indeed, the term indeed the term pratipatti that ends the first line, pratipattaye, pratipatti, uh, means to comprehend as well as to enter. Kalidasa's prayer to the divine pair is for the success of Kalidasa's poetic undertaking so that both he and we may enter into the poem, which he compares to an ocean made of speech and meaning. In later verses also, he talks about entering the story like a string enters a gem to make a necklace. But hidden within the simple and easy grammar and syntax of the opening verse is a mine of philosophy, metaphor, suggestion, and sound effects. Let us take the sound ornamentation first. The very, very first word of the very first verse is vak or vach. It's, it's actually vach, but because of Sanskrit sandhi, it becomes vag. Vach has been viewed from the Vedic times as a goddess, the very womb of creation, later identified with Saraswati. Compounded with it is artha, the second word or meaning. He's praying that he may be proficient in combining sound and meaning. Sound and speech has, is both contained in this term watch. Let me read this verse aloud for the sound effects again, and then I will play, hopefully. Vagartha vivasampakta vagartha pratipattaye but it doesn't allow me to I had a doesn't allow me to do it sorry about it I had a little somebody singing it not me you run away if I sing um, you see the repetition and let me Put the next thing here. 
see I have given some color coding here just to, so that we can. Um, see the diphthong ao, the heaviest grade of the vowel called vriddhi in Sanskrit and the dual ending in Sanskrit, you know. It is repeated four times, vagar tau, vivasangpik tau, and then you have jagatah pitarau, vande parvati parameshvarau, right? The aus are going here. Uh, and the middle of the two feet, you know, the middle two feet, and this is ao, uh, is sort of brackets them, and the middle two uh, ends in a, which is the next heaviest called guna in Sanskrit. Uh, so you have pratipatta ye, vande, hmm? The verse begins with the semi-vowel v, watch. And Kalidasa carries this sound forward, repeating it seven times. I have given the v in red there. So it repeats it seven times, a sacred number both in India and elsewhere. The beginning of vagartha is carried into the beginning of the second foot, which is vagartha pratipattaye. There is, I think, another hidden clue in this verse to watch speech, uh, in this case, Sanskrit speech. This is not, uh, this has not been uh, noticed by anyone else and I present here with some hesitation. The first verse of this poem contains each segment of the Sanskrit sound. Let me see here, there you go. So this is the entire Sanskrit alphabet. Hmm? Uh, it goes from, uh, first you have the, uh, the series of vowels, then you have the consonants. Consonants go uh, vertically from guttural, from the back of the mouth to the front of the mouth, K guttural, palatal, uh, retroflex, dental, and, pal uh, and uh, labial. Then it goes from the left to the right, going from the hard to the soft, to the nasal, and to the semi-vowels, and the sibilants. So that's how the sort of it is arranged. Um, There is also the ret retroflex group, the ter, uh, but given their harshness, Kalidasa appears to have deliberately avoided them, giving only the corresponding vowels to uh, r in Sangprakta. Hmm. The, most uh, the most repeated sounds are v, the first component of vaj, and r, the first consonant of arta, both occurring the hallowed seven times. So I have given at the bottom all the sounds that you have in the first verse, and you can see that every part of the Sanskrit alphabet is touched upon. So in a sense, in the very first uh, verse, Kalidasa uh, brings to the fore uh, the Sanskrit word, meaning all the Sanskrit sounds. So much for the sound, now for the meaning. Why and how are Parameshwara and Parvati united? Parameshwara is Shiva, God. Parvati is his consort, his wife. And why is that union like speech and meaning? It's not obvious. It seems to take a little sense, make a little sense to an English reader. Here we have come, we come to the philosophy of this verse. One part, the union of Parameshwara and Parvati, derived from the emerging Shaiva philosophy of the eternal unity of the two ultimate principles, Shiva and Shakti, the male and the female. A unity that later becomes the cornerstone of tantric religion and philosophy. This eternal union of the divine principles personified in the divine couple is compared by Kalidasa to the union of speech, sound, and meaning. The latter is derived from the philosophy of language developed in the main exegetical tradition of India called Mimangsa. This philosophy views Sanskrit as the eternal language and the Veda composed in Sanskrit as eternal, authorless, and self-existent. The eternality of Sanskrit speech sounds and demands their eternal union with their respective meanings. It is commonplace today to think of the connection between speech and sound and their respective meanings as contingent and even arbitrary. The animal giving milk for us for our morning cereal can be called cow in English, go in Sanskrit, or wash in French without affecting the animal in any way. But Vedic exegesis cannot do this without undermining it, the eterna eternality of the Veda. For them, the connection between speech, Sanskrit sounds, and their corresponding meanings is invariable, eternal, and non-contingent. This is the philosophy that is alluded to by Kalidasa when he compares the eternal union of Shiva and Parvati to the union of speech and their meanings. 
Kalidasa prays to these united divinities so he may demonstrate skill in the use of speech and meaning, that is, in crafting poetry. The grammatical genders of the words Kalidasa employs assist the comparison. Parvati is not just a goddess, the term is grammatically feminine, while Parameshwara is masculine. Likewise, among the terms in the simile, Vach, the counterpart of Parvati, is feminine, while Artha is masculine. Phew, that was long, and I think you all thank you for, uh, for patiently hearing me out. As I conclude, let me leave you with a few stray thoughts about the historical context of the classics we read. When we... When we admire the great pyramids of Egypt or the soaring spires and the architecture, architectural marvels of medieval European cathedrals, let us spare a thought for the sweat, blood, and taxes of the poor masters and slaves that built them. The grand plantation houses of the South and the great rooms and expensive wines of All Souls College, Oxford, been there, done that, were erected uh, on the backs of slaves and slave labor in the Caribbean sugar plantations. Likewise, the wonderful poetry, the great philosophical poems, and the grand treatises of law, medicine, and astronomy of the Indian canon of classics have a darker underbelly. They sustained and promoted a society built on deep inequality and misogyny, where the vast majority of the people and all women were kept servile without access to resources and education. Two verses from the famous law book of Manu, which I translated many years ago, illustrates this. On women, Day and night, men should keep their women from acting independently. Who are attached as they are to sensual pleasures, men should keep them under their control. Her father guards her in her childhood, her husband guards her in her youth, and her sons guard her in her old age. Woman is not qualified to act independently. They pay no attention to beauty, they pay no attention to age. Whether he is handsome or ugly, they make love to him with a single thought, he's a man, he's a man. This is the man's wet dream of a woman, right? <laughs> <coughs> Lechery, fickleness of mind, and hard-heartedness are innate in them. And this is about the low-caste shudras. If a once-born man, a shudra, hurls grossly abusive words at a twice-born man, his tongue shall be cut off. If he invokes their names and cast with disdain, a red-hot iron nail ten inches long, should be driven into his mouth. If he arrogantly gives instruction on the law, on dharma here actually, to Brahmin, the king should pour hot oil into his mouth and ears. All that does not take away the lofty poetry and deep philosophy of these classics, just as slave labor does not diminish the beauty of a cathedral or a pyramid. But it is salutary to keep those historical contexts in mind as we read these wonderful and edifying books. And I thank you. Thank you.